Welcome everyone. Uh, this is our exclusive interview uh, as on behalf of IFTA with uh, our keynote speaker, Mr. John Bollinger. John, welcome. Well, thanks very much, Ron. It's a pleasure to be here. Happy to um, do this interview with IFTA. Uh, and, and just as a, as a brief preamble, of course, John, you, you're very well known for, for the Bollinger Band indicators, which I'll, I'll maybe kickstart a, a question on. Uh, but also, I wanted to um, uh, add, uh, y y in some years ago, you are also an IFTA Lifetime Achievement Awardee. Um, I think back uh, several years ago in Singapore, you were given that award. And it was one of the greatest honors of my career. I'm still humbled by that experience. Uh, so great to maybe uh, build on, on the Bollinger Band's indicators. Uh, many people, of course, will, will, will uh, know them, use them. But if you could give us a, a little bit of the backstory as to how Bollinger Bands came into creation. Well, um, I created Bollinger Bands in the very early 1980s. Um, in those days, we did a lot of our technical analysis by hand. Um, we kept um, indicators and such on, um, you know, long yellow pads and polymer, polymer sort of accounting pads and such like that. And um, I was an option trader at, at the time. And I was very lucky amongst technicians. I was also a, a little bit of an electronics hobbyist. So I had an early microcomputer. This was in the days before IBM created, created the PC. Um, but I had a working um, microcomputer, ran the CPM operating system, and it allowed me to run a spreadsheet, an early version of spreadsheet, it was called uh, SuperCal. And I would do um, keep track of all my option positions and, um, and all, all my investments um, on that spreadsheet. And um, if you've ever traded options or know anything about options, you understand that the, the key to being a successful option trader is um, understanding both uh, historical volatility and um, implied volatility. That is the, the option that is um, the, the volatility that is buried in an options price. So um, one day I, I was I was copying I copied down a formula for volatility in uh, a column of the spreadsheet, and I saw that the calculation for volatility was running, uh, changing over time. Now, that was important to me because I, ha I, I was in the middle of a big research project. So when I came into the business, the first technical tools that I really explored were trading bands. Um, those trading bands, um, in, in, in those days, were simply a moving average reflected up and down by some percentage. So. Um, you know, uh, um, a moving average of the Dow um, with a line of four and a half percent above it or four and a half percent below it. And we would, we, we would couple price action within those bands with the action of indicators based on uh, advances and declines on up and down volume, um, you know, uh, broad, mark, broad market indicators. So if we tag the, the upper band and one of those indicators was negative, we take that as a sell alert, and we tag the lower band, one of those indicators was positive, we take that as a buy alert. The problem with that is markets change over time. The volatility characteristics of, of markets change a lot over time. So you're constantly having to readjust the bands. You know, in one, one regime, you need 4% bands, in another re regime, you need 7% bands. Uh, nothing's changed, just the, the you know, market activity. So, the, and the problem with that is um, you're constantly having to hand fit the bands. And when you do so, you let emotions into the trading process. If you're bullish, you, you set the bands to present a bullish picture. If you're bearish, you set the bands to, to present a bearish picture. And that, that was very hard to overcome. So I was looking for some mechanism to, to, to make trading bands adaptive. Um, and when I saw that volatility was as volatile as it was, I thought, well, maybe we could use that volatility calculation to set the width of bands. And, and, and that was the genesis of Bollinger Bands. Now, it's, it's interesting because at the time, we believed that volatility was a static quantity. We believed that it didn't change over time. Um, 
for example, if, if you use uh, um, the calculation of beta, which is a, the, the, a, market, a stock's sensitivity to the market, we thought that you know, a, a stock's beta was simply a, a, a stock's beta. It was like uh, the wall is wider, the sky is blue. Um, and then if it changed at all, it only changed over the life cycle of a company. From when a company was small, young, and growing, maybe its beta would be 1.8 or 2. And as it matured, it would head gradually toward um, the level of 1. Um, so that, that's the only way we thought the volatility really changed. But, um, you know, those ideas were in the air at, at the time. For example, Richard Engel some years ago got the Nobel Prize for um, the observation that um, the that economic series, um, the volatility of economic series was in fact volatile, um, and that led to the whole um, the whole idea of Garch and Arch. So a lot of people were thinking about this at the time. I just happened to be the one working on the trading band problem um, that was thinking about this. And you know, the moment I coupled um, a measure of volatility, and, and I chose standard deviation after looking at several alternatives. The moment I coupled a, um, a measure of volatility um, with a moving average and, and such, I realized that I had to, the answer to, to the question that I'd been uh, working on. So I, I guess I'd worked on it for three years or, or, or so, maybe maybe even four years. Yeah, just about four years, because I, I started working on it very late on 1970s, probably 78 or so. Well, an interesting in, in terms of market regime, to kind of borrow the word that you you, uh, you shared, um, John, because looking back at the long-term chart of uh, uh, equity markets, the bear market prior to that, 66 to 82, um, mm -hmm. was you know one of the well-known roller coaster rides. <laughs> uh, for, oh yeah, for, for traders of that era, um, w w is it is it fair to say that that maybe set the scene? For, for volatility type indicators thereafter? Well, I think, yeah, yes, obviously it's, it, it's, it's fair. It's more than fair. Um, that environment from uh, 66 through 82, as you pointed out, which, which contained the, the great 73, 74 bear market, um, that, um, you know, was, was a very, very challenging environment. We had the great post World War II bull market um, that had roared for um, some 20 years up until '62. Some make the top in '66. It just depends on you know what index you look at and how, how you like to, to pick it. But you had a very very long bull run where where investing was basically a slam dunk. And in that in in that world, um, you know people like Markowitz and and other people um, started putting forth modern portfolio theory and um, the efficient market people um, pointed out that, you know, big bull run, it's really hard to beat the market because, you know, everything's going, every, everything's going north. And I, I think the book was actually published. That's, that, that, that's correct. But, you know. Yeah, I was just saying, I think the book was actually published in 1974, uh, Random Walk Down Wall Street. Yeah, Bernard Macchio. Um um, so, you know, that was the environment, um, that we were in and, you know, the efficient market people, you know, were right to a certain extent. If you're, we talk, talked about this earlier when we were chatting, um, if, if you're a really large institution, you effectively are the market and, 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 and beating the market's really, really, really hard, um, for you because you, you own such a big piece of the market. I always use CalPERS, uh, the California Public Employee Retirement System, as an example. They are the market and all their efforts to try to beat the market have, have really ended up coming for naught and spent a huge amount of money and a lot of time and, 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 and a lot of effort in trying to do that without any real success at all. Um, but, you know, for people who are smaller than that, uh, institutions that are smaller than that, you know, I think it's entirely possible to meet the market. Of course, it's very hard during a great bull run when, it, when all the boats are rising with, with the tide. Um, but during times when you have, you know, bull and bear swings and sideways markets and such like that, then, you know, that's the ideal fuel for market timers. They can, they can make hay in those markets. 
And so, I mean, it brings us to, to the, the subject of your presentation at the IFTA conference. So without stealing the thunder um, of, of, your, of your key message, um, it's, it's on the subject of indexing and indexing for, for technicians, as, as I read the title here. Um, please, can you share us some key insights about indexing and, and what you've discovered um, in, in, in your recent work? I think that the most important thing to understand about indexing is that indexing itself is a method. Um, um, and, you know, each of the indexing methods has its strengths and its weaknesses. Um, for example, the Dow 30 is a price weighted index and um, the largest stocks in that have the, the highest price stocks in that have the largest impact. On, on the index, but the the benchmark for, for for most investors is the S and P 500, and that's a very special index um, because it has a very special quantity. Each day, because it is a capitalization weighted index, that is the 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 weight of each stock in the index is the price of the stock times. The, its outstanding float, the, the number of shares that they have available for, for trading. So each day, each stock that rises on that day gets a little more weight in the index. And each stock that falls on that day gets a little less weight in the index. So in fact, the S&P 500 is an incredibly efficient relative strength allocator. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, a great market timing mechanism. So the question is whether your market timing me mechanism is better than their market timing mechanism, not whether you want to use a market timing mechanism. Because if you invest in the S&P 500, by definition, you are using a market timing method. Um, in, in, in that case, that method is called relative strength. Um, and um, again, the S&P 500 is an incredibly efficient relative strength allocator. How much concern do you have, John, I mean, uh, on, on the concentration of uh, uh, market cap stocks in the S&P 500, such as the, the, the infamous tech fang stocks? I mean, it, it's, it's just been the rah-rah the story of this year since the bounce back from the crash lows uh, of Mark. Well, you know, I think it's a pretty big problem. Uh, you know, NASDAQ recognized uh, um, this um, some years back and they capped Apple's um, exposure in the NASDAQ composite. Um, they just wouldn't let it grow beyond a certain uh, percentage. I don't think that S&P has ever done anything like that. Um, last I checked, um, six stocks composed 20% of the S&P, um, and the bottom 100, the 100 smallest stocks in the S&P were less than 5% of the index. Um, so it's a, um, it's a very, very skewed um, index. There's, there, there's no question about that. But it does its job very efficiently. Um, so if, um, you know, it, 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 it's a hard bogey to beat because it is in fact a very efficient relative strength action. And, and, and I guess to some extent it'll offer, you know, lead and lag divergence signals. Like for example, if we compared uh, NASDAQ, uh, uh, otherwise known as Tech Street versus Wall Street, Dow, S&P 500, and then Main Street, Russell 2000, you know, it's, it's a form of breadth uh, relative uh, measure as well, to giving an idea of um, what's been outperforming uh, over over other stocks. Yeah, um, I think that's right. Uh, you know, one way to look at that is just there's an equal weighted version of the S and P 500 published, um, and you can look at the equal weighted version versus the performance of, of the cap weighted version, um, and that 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 contains a lot of information. For example, the cap weighted version has been pounding. Um, the equal weighted version for quite a long time. And that's a, you know, that was a big message um, that you needed to get right. Uh, so you needed to be involved in, you know, the, the largest cap stocks um, in order to 
stay in the game. Um, so you can, you know, th there's lots of ways to, to take this apart. What interests me most, um, actually, is subsetting indexes. Um, I think, you know, via, you know, some clever algorithms, and we'll, we'll talk about some of that in my IFTA talk, but um, I think through, you know, clever algorithms and, and, and some, some good choices, one can very successfully subset an index um, and do very well against that index. Uh, you know, I'll tell you a funny story. So I'm a CFA I'm, in addition to being a, a CMT. And I, I studied for my CFA in the years 1983, uh, 1984, 1985, and 1986, um, taking the, the, uh, the tests. Uh, tests always occur in, in May of, of uh, each year, or at least they did back in those days. Um, and you know, early on in the CFA process, uh, a, a guy that I was uh, um, studying with um, looked at me and, and, and said, you know, well, the whole argument here is that you, you can't beat the, you, you, you can't beat the, the market as, as defined by the S&P 500. And I said, oh, yes, you can. All you have to do is eliminate the poorly performing stocks. So, you know, I've been interested in this idea of trying to subset um, indices for the benefit of portfolios um, for a very long time. I think it's a very powerful idea. I think it's an underappreciated, underutilized, underdiscussed idea. Um, and I think if people start thinking about it, they'll realize there's tremendous value there. You, you think about it, people do it without thinking about it. When you invest in sector ETFs, that's essentially what you're doing. You're, you're investing in subsets of, of these indices and, and they're, they're, they're run the same way. So it's not like it's a unique or, 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 or totally you know, uh, new shiny idea. The idea has been with us for a long time. I just think that if practitioners focus on subsetting, um, they can really add value to their clients' portfolios. And uh, well, I, I noticed in, in your, um, as part of the uh, key points in, in your presentation, ESG is, is, a, uh, is a key area. Uh, what was the inspiration for, for that focus? Well, you know, a, a couple of years ago, my daughter joined um, our firm and she brought with her a, a real interest in ESG investing. Um, she had um, an extensive background in, in the area and really wanted to do something. And, um, you know, this idea of ethical investing has a very long history um, and it's mostly underperformed the, the markets um, at, as a whole. And so I, I looked at her and I said, I, I'm, I'm totally fine with doing something in the ESG space, but we have to do it right. So what we did is we built uh, um, from scratch um, a couple of ESG indexes and then looked at ways of subsetting them. Um, and, you know, that's essentially the heart of my talk. So I'm not going to give that much more away. <laughs> <laughs> they can stay tuned to, to the talk. Um, uh, close to the time. I, I think, I think you'll find it uh, um, very interesting. It's iconoclastic in, 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 in a number of ways. Uh, but it's also, very, very practical. This stuff is, you know, relatively easy to do. You have to be very disciplined, um, but um, you can you can really add value to client portfolios um, with this, you know, this idea of subset using technical tools. Um, and maybe just as as, as a uh, segue question on on the uh, the position of technical analysis and market timing. Uh, right here and now on a, on a kind of a bigger picture level question uh, what's your sense in terms of this, this age-old debate about passive versus active investing and, and where technical analysis you know, adds value in the current cycle so I think you know passive investing is a reality only for the very largest uh, investors uh, uh, other people can um, and, and I think should take a more active um, approach, whether it's a, a, a simple little allocation mechanism, um, uh, 
you know, it, it's it's pretty easy to, to add value. Um, I need, you know, look look at look at it this way. Harry Brown, um, uh, very well known uh, market technician, um, long long retired, um, put forth the idea of this permanent portfolio. You're going to take it, the portfolio and cut it up into four pieces. Um, you can have uh, quarter stocks, a quarter bonds, um, a quarter cash, and a quarter gold. Um, so th that that's that's a great idea, um, and it and it works well over time, um, and it tends to be much less volatile than the market as a whole. Uh, and investors can be pretty pretty happy with that, I, except the ones that are looking over the S and P five hundred. That's you know on on its own going to beat that portfolio in many years. But think about it, just take a very simple little allocation um, algorithm and, and say, okay, well, let, let's work with a permanent portfolio. And, but instead of just one quarter, one quarter, one quarter, let's make it adjustable. Let, let's say we, you know, a, a, any, any element of the portfolio can, can range from 10% to 50%. Um, and, and you adjust it based on the performance of the components, you know, what's working in versus what's not. And you, you give higher allocations to what's working and lesser allocations to what's not. For example, you know, gold is a very, very trendy uh, um, time series. So when gold is rising, you, you add a little extra weight to, to gold. When gold is not rising, you pull some, some, some weight away from it. when stocks are doing well, you add a little extra weight to, to stocks when, you know, so I, I think that the idea of active investing, you know, can be something as simple as, as, as once, once a month sitting down with a yellow pad and, 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 you know, making a few tiny little calculations and, and adjusting your portfolio, or it can be something as active as running, you know, a, a very active relative strength program that's making daily changes in, in a portfolio. So, you know, there's a range of possibilities. That's why, you know, it, it always disturbs me so much when I hear people saying, ah, market timing is not for me. I say, what do you mean? Is making money not for you? Uh, <laughs> it, just, it just doesn't make any sense because it, there's so many approaches and they can be really suited to the individual, to their risk and reward criteria. And they, you know, they can be happy. Um, versus, you know, how many people, you know, can put all their money in the S&P 500 and live through the kind of drawdown we saw in the first three months of this year? I think, you know, there's so many people puked out all of their positions near the bottom and are now sitting there after this massive rally that has ensued going, oh my God, you know, I've missed the entire i missed the entire recovery process. So I, I think, you know, I think the case against passive invest, investing is, is very clear and the case for active investing is also very clear. It, it, I mean, maybe part of um, the kind of uh, market timing benefit of making money, as you, as you quite uh, aptly said it, um, also flips into a double benefit of, of risk management, particularly when the market is just so risk centric uh, in, in terms of the, uh, the destruction of diversification in, in too much indexation, <laughs> um, if you see what I mean. Do you, how much? Uh, so that's one, that's one of the really, the, the people really, I don't think understand this that well, um, indexing all this money that's going in, into these um, ETFs and, and, and such like that, like SPY and QQQ, to name a couple of the largest that, that, that are around. Those ETFs weld together the stocks that are in them. When money comes in, they must buy the whole list of stocks. When money comes out, they must sell the whole list of, of stocks. Um, so, you know, I think that that's becoming a very, very tough game to play. Um, and um, I, I think it's a, a really deleterious effect on um, the, the areas of the stock market that are covered by those, uh, by those indexes. Uh, you know, I, I, I must say I'm a little bit of a heretic in, in this regard. 
you know, everybody wants to invest in the ETFs these days. Everybody wants to index it. You know, even if it's active in, in indexing and stuff like that. But I love investing in individual stocks. I, I think that that's where the real opportunities are. With with the crowd headed 100% toward you know all of these um, exchange traded funds and mutual funds of various sorts and, and types, I think the the, the 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 vistas are being opened for people like myself and my firm um, that want to invest in individual stocks. Um, we've, we've had some terrific opportunities uh, this year. Um, and I, I think we'll continue to have opportunities because you know the vast majority of people aren't looking over into our into the world of individual stocks. They're all about you know exchange traded funds and and uh, um, you know passive investing and such. So it's just um, it it's really a land of plenty stock picking. And, and, and just to add, just a, a, a final kind of. Uh, risk question, uh, more in line with, with the market that you were born from, John, the options market. So there's been a lot of talk about uh, overheated leverage positioning in, in the options market from big and small money. So institutional retail space. Uh, I mean, for, for all the audience out there, IFTA professionals and, and the like, what's your sense of, of the, the uh, extent of the option market situation at the moment? I, I'm not sure that I have a really good handle on that. Um, I know that there's a lot of option activity out there. I keep a number of option uh, indicators. So uh, I keep a, 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 a fairly you know, good sense of the pulse of that market. Um, but I'm not sure how important that is. Um, for example, um, coming into the U.S. elections, virtually all of the exchanges and many of the brokerage houses have started gradually raising their um, margin requirements, reducing the leverage that's available to customers, both professional um, and um, and amateur. And you know that ranges from you know um, the the brokerage firms catering to um, professionals like interactive brokers to uh, brokerage firms. Um, catering to uh, individuals like TD Ameritrade. Um, all of these entities have raised, raised their margins. Now, I must say they seem to have done so pretty responsibly. They're doing it gradually and, and they've made announcements way in advance so they're not disrupting the markets by doing so. So I think there's, that there's some understanding that, that leverage may be, uh, may have gotten, uh, you know, I, I don't know exactly how to say it. There's too much use of leverage out there. Um, so these firms are starting to lean against the wind. And the same is true for brokerage firms. Uh, they're doing the same um, sorts of things. Um, so um, I don't know. I, I, I keep on hearing, you know, um, people talk about a couple of big players that are using um, call option buying to drive the prices of individual stocks, you know, I think people, you know, the big firms, the, 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 the big Wall Street firms, they understand what's going on there. And, you know, they're fully capable of taking the other side of that trade. Um, so I, I'm not as worried about it as some people are. I, I, I do see it um, as, a, as a potential problem, but I always see leverage it as a problem. You know, leverage is the great destroyer. Um, if, if uh, when, whenever there's been a blow up in the stock market, you, you, you look back and what was behind it, some form of leverage. Um, it, 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 it's, it's happened time and time and time again. So I've never been a fan of leverage. Or when, when, it, when I've used it, I've used it very judiciously. Um, I think, um, as I said, that it is in fact a great destroyer. And and I mean, kind of a, a macro and technical question in one. Um, that old phrase, "Don't fight the tape, don't fight the Fed." What are your perspectives on both of those statements in the current environment? Oh, the tape's pretty strong, and the Fed's pretty strong, so <laughs> prices are going up. I, I mean, it it seems very straightforward. Marty Zweig famously coined those. Um, 
phrases that I mean it was much older market wisdom, but he he put those phrases in in into the vernacular via his appearances on Wall Street Week, uh, Louis Rukeyser's uh, TV show um, many years ago. He would you know constantly remind people, don't fight the Fed, don't fight the tape. So you know th that that's great wisdom, um, and and I think it is important today um, as it was then. Um, if the, the Fed's providing liquidity and, 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 and you know, ensuring that the that, that financial environment is conducive to higher stock prices, you ought to pay attention. And if stock prices are rising, you ought to pay attention. Um, and uh, just a, a, a kind of a, a final question on my side from uh, the new generation of traders, um, uh, particularly new traders that have literally started this year uh, from the crash lows into what has been a phenomenal bull market. What key lessons um, can, can some of those new traders learn um, from your years of experience, yours and many other veteran technicians in terms of just, just the, how market regimes uh, behave and maybe more specific to our original uh, starting point of uh, market uh, market cycles and, and and the rotation from one to another. Well, you know, if you take any old professional and ask them what's the worst thing that could happen to a beginning trader, and they all look at you and say, "Oh, that that first trade is a huge win." <laughs> <laughs> And I'm afraid that we've 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 created um, an enormous crop of traders who feel that they can do no wrong. That no matter what they buy, no matter how they buy it, um, no matter how little discipline they use, um, they're going to make money. And um, they're going to find out that all of those things are wrong. Um, they're going to find out that what they buy is incredibly important. They're going to find out that how they buy it is incredibly important. They're going to find out how much leverage they use is incredibly important. And sitting atop of all of that, they're gonna find out that, that self-discipline is the number one determinant of investment performance. Very wise words, John, and um, one that I think that will uh, create uh, a lot of ongoing learning here with uh, many of our IFTA members around the world. Uh, we hope to uh, receive uh, thousands of, of attendees in this first time online 24-hour conference and we're really really excited to have you on, on board as our keynote speaker John well what I'm really looking forward to beyond this conference which I, I obviously am very excited about but I'm looking forward to next year's conference where I can meet and greet my fellow analysts and portfolio managers and technicians and talk about ideas and get to see people in the flesh once again uh, we, we uh, the conference organizers completely agree with you and, uh, and we, we also know that many of the members will too so we, we look forward to things right. going back to some new normal um, in, in next year and, and, and thereafter so I wish you a great conference this year I'm happy to contribute to it but you know I'm hoping for a regular conference next year we do too and uh, any final words John that you'd like to share with with the audience you know it's not really the name of the game is discipline and, and you know um, beyond that um, you know, I no, not really thank you thank you very much John my pleasure